Great. Um, good afternoon and welcome everybody um, to the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities Summer School uh, keynote lecture. Um, it's uh, a beautiful sunny day in Glasgow. Hope it is wherever it is that you are in Scotland or beyond today as well. I'm seeing a couple of faces going, no, not quite. <laughs> um, but it's nice to have that for the very first day of our summer school. My name's Claire Squires, if you haven't met me before, and I'm the director at SAGSA. Um, as those of you who've been with SAGSA for a couple of years will know, over the past couple of years, um, we've done a series during our summer school of short online keynotes. Um, uh, we're doing because we're doing a hybrid summer school this year we've got some more keynotes at the end of the week and I'll tell you about a bit more about those at the end of the session but we've only got a short amount of time so I'm very quickly um, going to go on to introduce our speaker today who I'm absolutely delighted has been able to join us from Oxford um, so Dan Hicks is professor of contemporary archaeology at the University of Oxford and curator at the Pitt Rivers Museum and a fellow of St. Cross College. Dan works on the material and visual culture of the human past up to and including um, the modern colonial contemporary and digital world and on the history of archaeology, anthropology, art and architecture. His curatorial work has ranged widely with his most recent book, which I'm sure many of you will know, being the British Museums, the Benin Bronzes, Colonial Violence and Cultural Restitution. Um, Dan um, is going to uh, deliver us, I'm sure, what's going to be a thought provoking and extremely current uh, lecture on excavating the war on culture. Um, so, Dan, over to you and thank you very much for joining us. OK, many thanks. Uh, really wonderful to be here. I'm just going to put two links in the chat that relate to things I'm going to talk about, the first of which relates to an intervention that just happened over the over the past week in uh, Birmingham, uh, which is by Hugh Locke. Um, so, OK, so I've got 20 minutes or so to talk to you about something that I'm calling how we can excavate the war on culture. So the short version of this lecture really is that it isn't a culture war. It's a war on culture. It's a weaponization of arts and humanities and culture that runs across our notions of the monument, our notions of the museum, our sense of uh, disciplinary knowledge in our universities from art and architecture to archaeology and anthropology and far beyond. So when I say that the war on culture has a history, this is something that starts really with some of the things I realized while sort of writing about the Benin uh, bronzes and thinking about the museum, as of course in my last book I did, in terms of something that in the late 19th century was, was uh, co-opted and uh, weaponized in a very, you know, actually a very certain way, in which there was a very strange sort of synergy, I noticed, in writing about the framing of the Benin expedition of the late 1890s, which was this enormous attack upon what is uh, now Nigeria, in which the framing, as it turns out, so often happened, for these attacks upon African societies and uh, beyond was framed as a punishment. It was framed as a punitive expedition. So what happens again and again in these, in these wars, and of course, let's remember, we think, of course, in terms of the, the, uh, the British involvement internationally over the course of the centuries, over the course of the past uh, 250 years or so, you know, actually, we think of the UK on the international stage, maybe in terms of abolition and emancipation in the early 19th century. Maybe then we skip through. Actually, maybe we think about the, the Crimean War a little bit with everything that's happening at the moment. But then really there's this sort of gap until we get to the First World War and the Second World War. We have this immense Queen Victoria-sized gap in our, our popular historical consciousness, in which, of course, the story often is almost that we 
sort of won abolition, that it was a success, that this was a victory, this was a positive thing that the British did. Certainly, I think when we got the 200 year anniversary of 1807 back in 2007, that was the missed opportunity there. That's that's how things ended up. So abolition, emancipation, often all also simply celebrated, not understood as a part of, you know, of ongoing violence. And then it's the First World War, it's the Second World War, it's the two world wars and um, sort of one World Cup. And there is your sense of, you know, the UK on the international stage. And what that misses is that every in every year that uh, Victoria was on the throne, there were not only wars, there were massive uh, military expeditions and interventions that ran across the continent of Europe, across South Asia, uh, you know, and elsewhere in the world. So many of those attacks, as I say, were framed as a punishment. That notion of the punitive expedition where some infraction may be the continuity of slavery in some cases, may be the killing of a small number of uh, white men in others, were used as the justification for reprisal. And that logic of reprisal so often reoccurs, of course, over the 20th century from Kenya to Northern Ireland. Um, and so what you end up with, of course, then, is a sense that was, as, as I was writing about what I call in the book that sort of white projection, the projection of your own violence upon someone else. We, you know, the logic of the punitive expedition is, look what you made me do. But that pathology, very strangely, I started noticing in the cultural sector as well. So in what has been called a culture war, so often the framing has been that the curators in the museums or those who are looking after, after our hist historic uh, built environment, or those that want to move a statue from A to B or to rename a street, all of which, of course, is to keep these institutions, these sort of parts of, of our heritage in step with our times, that is, they are presented as attacking culture. And then the culture warrior right come in and are framed as the defenders. What that misses, it's the same trip, right? In fact, we are starting, I think, as a field to recognize a very distinctive horizon from the late 19th century into the early years of the 20th century, where a war on culture, the weaponization of arts and culture was put to work very specifically for the purposes of a cultural supremacy. Not for nothing is, you know, are we learning that the Confederate statues were, uh, were put up outside the law courts in so many, or the courthouses in so many of the Southern American towns in the late 19th century, early 20th century, at the same time as uh, Cecil Rhodes' image was being erected in Cape Town and in Oxford, where Edward Coulson, a seventh you know, figure from the 17th century in, in, the, in, the 80, in 1895, was being erected in, in uh, Bristol. And at the same time, our museums were, were being transformed into spaces where you could not simply display loot, as had been happening in the British Museum since the 18th century, but could link that to very specific narratives of a cultural supremacy linked to the, the, uh, the technological changes that were happening so rapidly in the course of the scramble for Africa. So the better weapons uh, technology as a technological superiority spills over then into a story about the superiority of more widely material culture, certainly in my institution at the Pitt Rivers, Augustus Pitt Rivers, 1875 lecture on the evolution of culture was all about an evolutionary approach, not to nature, but to culture and also to material culture. But those ideas we see across actually the civic spaces and also into our universities as well. So I think this is what I'm saying, that we're starting to sort of recognize that 
the fallism movement for statues or the restitution movement for objects in our museums are not attacks upon these institutions or heritage or arts. They are responses to an attack that has already happened in the in that late 19th century and uh, you know and that is actually continuing in the it, it, sort of in you know in into the present so the link that i've uh, given you there um to the piece i just wrote in hyperallergic about an intervention in the center of birmingham with a statue of Queen Victoria erected in actually 1951 as a replacement for a marble statue that was erected in uh, 1901. That has been, yeah, there's an intervention there from the, from, you know, from the artist Hugh Locke that reimagines that Victoria that looks at by, by uh, reproducing her, her image multiple times, looks at the way in which the image and the name of uh, Victoria became sort of transported across empire and across the Commonwealth. It's a commission that's happening in the context of the Commonwealth Games that are about to start in uh, Birmingham. But what's interesting from our perspective is that immediately the response from really, you know, powerful uh, figures within Birmingham, the people from the Civic Society and the people from the Birmingham, uh, the, the, uh, the big arts uh, initiative or sort of you know, project there. They, they, they are people responding by saying that this is a desecration, this is woke rubbish, this is wrong, we need to show respect to these statues. So we're, we're at a point, this very interesting point that we see so, so far across outdoors in our public spaces with statues or naming of roads, you know, indoors in our museums, where in some of the national museums, one dent even move an object from A to B or rewrite a label because of the worry that you're going to lose your funding from central government. How did we get to this idea that to update a university curriculum is to it is to cancel your Jane Austen or whoever it is this week that supposedly is not being taught. How is it that we got to a point in a defensive way in our sort of universities or our museums where we have to say, oh no, no, we're just adding, we're not taking away. Of course, we need to take some of these things away. Of course, it's okay to recognize once we understand these histories to say very specifically that we don't have a name for this thing yet. This transatlantic proto-fascist use of culture to tell a story about supremacy, but we have to understand that it was built to last. So in the final eight minutes or so that, that I've got available, I want to just expand on that a little bit and suggest how we might see this emergence of a weaponization of culture in the long durée. I think first off, we might say that the museum and the display of objects in this way may turn out to be an aberration in a longer history of the carceral. So enslavement over, over 200 or 250 years, you know, up until the 19th century, then gives way after emancipation in 1838, starts to, starts to give way to the imprisonment and display, you know, of objects in museums, of animals in zoos. That exhibitionary set of sort of practices lasts maybe in terms of the acquisition of objects until the early, or maybe until the Second World War or so, a hundred years or so. And then maybe carcerality moves into another realm, which is uh, mass incarceration. And here, I would say that Nicole Fleetwood's uh, recent book, which is called Marking Time, incredibly helpful especially when read alongside Christina Sharp's book In the Wake about the ongoing nature of the of the, of of enslavement and its and its afterlives 
So it may be that in terms of a history of locking up, a history of the casserole, that the museum is a short-term aberration in between uh, different forms of imprisonment of so-called others, spaces that were that were made in order to hold, in order to subjugate. But I think we can be more specific than that, and we can learn here from the work of the, you know, the pioneering work, in my view, of Sylvia Winter, the 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 Jamaican-based sort of her literary theorist who introduced in the late, you know, the 90s, really, her notion of what she called liberal monohumanism. So let's imagine it like this, that there's a crisis for white supremacy, for colonial authority that comes with abolition and emancipation. Part of the response that we're very aware of in anthropology is a biological, a, 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 a fake science response that started to write human superiority into human difference in terms of the biological. All those arguments that we get that, that sort of start to die out in the 1860s in the arguments between the ethnological and anthropological ideas of human difference but still persist in into eugenics and and of course into fascism in the early part of the 20th century that's one response to that crisis of this art of of this sort of liberal argument that we're all human but there's a far more pernicious argument that's part of this and here we can learn really from fanon where fanon in an essay in 1954 talks about two different forms of racism that emerge hand in hand in the 19th century, one of which is what I've just described, and which he describes as vulgar racism, racism based on the body, on the skin, on hair that tells, that, that, that seeks to co-opt the world of science for the purposes of hatred. But hand in hand, he argues, and I think we can, by learning from Winter and learning from Fanon, we can maybe see something in arts and culture and museums and universities that's really important at the moment. There's a second kind of racism that, that, that emerges at that point, and that is what Fanon calls cultural racism. And it's what Winter calls liberal monohumanism because the idea is we're all human, but some people have got, well, okay, how do we talk about human difference? Why is it that the British have got the machine guns and they're fighting African soldiers who have got bows and arrows or who have got other technologies? Very fast arguments over technological difference turn into arguments over cultural difference. So cultural superiority becomes incredibly important in terms of that attempt to set out a set of uh, justifications for empire, for colonial violence, in which only the beginning, the tip of the iceberg, is the display of the Benin uh, bronzes in so many of our museums across the UK. So white supremacy evolves into something else at this point, into cultural whiteness. And that, I think, is the real challenge as I start to wrap up in the final two minutes or so that I've got. I guess that's my main point here, that the war on culture is something that was created in that, in that sort of period of time that we seem to have, have a cultural um, you know, amnesia about in terms of the sheer violence, the sheer, sheer amount of you know, militarism that was, that was going on, extractivist uh, colonialism that was going on, actually corporate colonialism that was going on at that time in the late 19th century. Um, but there is, a, there is a very specific set of histories here, a very distinctive archeological layer that runs in between the 1880s and, and the 1920s, which is about the use of culture, whether a statue in the street, whether an exhibit in a museum, whether the invention of some of our disciplines, you know, even 
thinking about the university itself as being founded in that time in terms of the disciplinary structures that we're all working with and uh, within and sometimes against in the present. So when we hear important calls for the decolonization of the curriculum, for the decolonization of the museum, for the attempts to update and, and make right for our times, the names in the streets or the statues in our town squares, we have to see those conversations in terms of this emerging layer of history that we need to recognize and think about how it impacts our own research, our, our own discipline and the work that we do. What is it that happened in terms of the, of the creation of uh, cultural whiteness in this, you know, in this sort of period of time that came about somewhere between ideologies in, of enslavement and ideologies of uh, fascism. In that period of time in the Victorian age, we in our public discourse have so often got used to the idea of associations with the sugar money in the 1820s or 1810s or the emancipation payments of 1838. We've, we've got so used to associations with uh, fascism or Mosley or whoever. Somehow, again, there's this disjunction. It's like, no, what, they're, they're, these things are completely unconnected. Um, whereas, of course, they are. And, you know, whether we read uh, Césaire or, or whether we read Hannah Arendt or whoever we read on the, on the complex uh, histories as we move in between our ideologies of imperialism, to, you know, into ideologies of, of, of fascism in the, in the 20th century, you know, we 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 have to look at the at the at the jam in the middle of that sandwich. We have to look at what is what is going on in this time period, which is a set of histories that are still with us. The final point then then sort of being that the reason that culture was put to work in these ways, the disciplinary creations in our universities, the statues in the streets, the exhibits in the museum, is that they're incredibly hard to change. That's the whole point. How can an artwork be hurtful? How can Shakespeare or Austin be in any way anything other than wonderful and things we ought to support? How can a statue be something anyone would be upset about? That's the point, right? These are, these, these are very specific worldviews the things they carry with them are still with us in the present. Recognizing them, whether in, in the form of an idea or whether in the form of an object is a major part of our challenge in, the, in I think, across the arts and humanities in the present. So that's my very fast attempt to convince you that it's not a culture war, it's a war on culture, and that we need to excavate that war on culture to think about its origins and think about its endurances. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dan. Uh, a wonderful provocation. Um, I'm sure there will be questions and comments and absolutely a round of applause. Thanks very much for everybody doing that virtually straight away. Um, I know there's a comment from Florian in the chat already and some more questions are going to come through, but I'm going to just take chair's privilege just to start off with um, and just say, um, kind of going back to your, your closing comments as your opening comments about it's not being a culture war. And I was also really struck by you said somewhere in the middle, we don't yet have a term available for these attacks upon woke, these are, you know, is, is part of the problem that we're too nuanced, we're wanting to understand. What, what, how, how can we cope with this when we're wanting to deliver complex understandings of history and present and culture and cultures? What, how, how do we deal with that whilst wanting to be nuanced and understanding and at the same time trying to put up with this, contend these, these sorts of attacks that don't have those kinds of concerns? Sure, absolutely. So there's a line somewhere in Marx uh, where he talks about the demonstrations in Hyde Park in, 19, in 1848, which is about the dying of the church and the growth of uh, capitalism. And he, the, 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 yeah, there's some line, I don't know, I, I don't remember the, the exact wording, but, 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 yeah, but it's about how a, how a sort of a dangerous animal, uh, when it's under attack and almost dead, 
in those moments is at its most sort of dangerous. And I think that's what we're seeing now to certain forms of sort of cultural whiteness that have been hardwired into civic society, hardwired into disciplinary thinking, hardwired into exclusionary spaces, which range from higher education to the arts and humanities and heritage sectors. And that's why you've got the creation of these really marginal groups, but, but they get incredible coverage in the right-wing press or wherever, and from uh, conservative MPs and so on, that are really, you know, in what, uh, of course, something that's fundamental to a certain form of power that still is important in the present is under attack and is dying out. I think once we see these patterns of culture, we can't unsee them. Um, there are so many sort of positive things we, we can do that are happening in, in a lot of our sectors in terms of the positive action initiatives to start to diversify our sectors in terms of the action to take apart physically some of the hurtful structures or displays. But yeah, we have to, we also, I think, intellectually have to be ready to understand these histories. And I think we do need a name for it. It isn't, I mean, I don't think it, 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 it isn't exactly proto-fascism. It isn't exactly some, yeah, I mean, I guess it's a form of white supremacy, but it has a very, that, that, that's, that's a very early 20th century phrase for something that has this sort of long 19th century history and that changes over time. And absolutely, I mean, to agree with the comments from F F Florian there, absolutely, ab abolition and emancipation. There's a kind of intellectual crisis there, which is, which is resolved. You know, these, these are arguments from uh, Winter, not from me, that, that, uh, that, that, that need to lead into a reformulation, a co-option of the very image of the human. So her, her big part of her idea of, 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 of liberal monohumanism is the creation of something that she calls man too, which is the image of humanity, the image of man, but actually that man that, that, that all of us are part of is just someone that looks like me. It's some middle-aged white guy. Uh, so yet again, and there's a, there's a, that's the trick, right? So that's the, that's the crisis and how it's resolved at that point along its uh, way. So even our notions of humanity, we see this. I mean, anthropology, our image of anthropos has had some of these conversations. Humanitarian literature, the, the notion of the human as not just being kind of positive, but actually actively discriminatory. I think that's another location we, we have seen some of these conversations, but we're just at the beginning, I think, for the humanities, right? This is, you know, what is it? Who, who counts as human in the humanities? Who are we teaching and what are we thinking? And how much of that is about, an, you know, an unfinished, sort of 200 year history. Great, thanks very much, Dan. And you're, you're obviously picking up on some of those comments in the in the chat already. So thanks so much for that. Just by the way, anybody who's, who's in the audience and actually wants to put your virtual hand up and ask a question rather than necessarily putting it on the chat, just be aware that we're recording and we will put this on our YouTube channel eventually. Um, but if you if you do want to engage with Dan in that way, please, please do. Um, uh, Dan, I don't know if you want to, I know you've looked at the chat yourself, shall I, shall I go to Victoria's question specifically, or is there something you want to take in a different order? I might read out Victoria's question just for people who can't see the chat. I couldn't agree more that it's not a culture war, but a war on culture. It infuriates me that this admittedly catchy phrase, I suppose that's following on from my question, isn't it, is parroted uncritically in the press. Can you imagine this changing and what can those of us do? Um, even if we are perhaps not directly involved in this field to help. Sure, absolutely. I mean, we have to push back when you've got a prime minister who says, you don't rewrite history, which means all the historians in this room, uh, yeah, you know, will be out, out, out of a job, right? Um, we, we, but we have, I think, to take this quite sort of seriously intellectually as well. I mean, I would say, I mean, one way to tell the story, I think, um, might well be, hang on, let me just get my get some notes that might help me uh, 
get this right. Yeah. So one way of thinking about this might be in terms of an intergenerational shift in how we think about and understand the past. So we're all aware, I'm sure, especially the historians amongst us, of the relationships between a certain form of realism or empiricism, a Rankian empiricism, uh, that sense of uh, V.S. Eigentlich Gewesen, how it really was. That's what we have to do as historians. That high imperial form of history, the Victorians wrote a lot of history, um, carries on right up to Hugh Trevor Roper's 1950s sort of descriptive nationalism founded on his famous line that a historian should love the past. So that's one layer in the discipline of history. We've maybe then from the 1960s, and I wrote about this a, a, you know, a little bit in my uh, chapter that just came out in uh, uh, What is History Now? which is a reflection on E.H. Carr um, after uh, 60 years, his, his book, uh, uh, What is History? Which, which sort of famously was a kind of interpretive and relativist, and we want to tell the story of the past on our own terms in the present. Uh, you know, reception theory is a very important part of that, as that idea of sort of relativism moves on into postmodernism. We get multiculturalism or a cosmopolitan reading of the past. Maybe now those two alternatives, the realism and the relativism, maybe we're into a third phase of how we think about and understand the past, which is about endurance or duration. That emerging sense of the unfinished nature of the human past as a lived experience, as a memory, as intergenerational, as survival. Um, that sense that the past, it isn't just what we say about the past that is unstable, but that the past itself is unstable. You know, you can move a statue from A to B, you can change a museum, you can keep what's good from the past, but excise what's bad. So I, I do think, I don't know if that's helpful, but I do, I hope it's helpful. I, for, for me, the thing I'm personally trying to grapple with is how does this intellectual, you know, what intellectual moment is this that we're in? Because it is, you know, I used to tell my students that uh, Thomas uh, Kuhn was completely wrong in his uh, accounts of how, how knowledge uh, changes, famously in the st structure of, of uh, scientific revolutions. He, he coined the term, uh, you know, the idea of a, a, a paradigm shift, that there's a period of what he called normal science, then this, there's this immense sort of revolutionary phase, and then suddenly everything settles down and you're into a new uh, paradigm. I always said, that, that's not, things don't work like that, that's a linear his, account of, of knowledge, that's not how knowledge works. But here we are, I mean, I would, there are things I would not sort of do or say or frame or do etc in my museum practice in my writing completely different to even only five years ago we are living through uh, i think in in the 2020s in my book i call it a decade of uh, returns but i think it's far bigger than that we're really living through a fundamental recalibration and i think a bit like the rose must fall movement the sense that it's a generational movement i mean remember why rose must fall happened in 2015 it was because apartheid had been had been ended supposedly in in uh, 1994 but there at the campus at, uh, at uh, uct there were students who'd been born after the end of apartheid who were 19 years old or 20 years old but were still experiencing racism on a day-to-day -day basis so the argument there was look at the heart of this campus there's this massive yeah, massive sort of monument to apartheid in the form of an image of uh, versus Rhodes, the you know, diamond miner the mass murderer the intellectual architect arguably of the color line and so on so of course removing that in a physical way is a key part of this if you know, you know if if art and culture didn't matter, if all of this was some distraction from the real work of anti-imperialism, anti-racism and so on, then these people wouldn't have spent all this time making this infrastructure. So understanding white infrastructure in those ways, I think, is, inc is incredibly important. But thinking intellectually about what intergenerational moment we're incredibly lucky to be living through. I mean, I've never felt more optimistic, I think, about my fields. Than you know, the fields across which I work, museums, art, architecture, archaeology, anthropology, history, whatever, you know, 
yeah, I mean, across all those fields, in different ways, you're seeing people really trying to recognize some of these legacies and to refuse some of them and to use the resources of the, of the, of the past for something really positive in the present. So I do think it's an incredibly exciting moment and I'm very hopeful personally. Thanks, Dan. Um, uh, Victoria, did you want to come back on that? I noticed you'd uh, put your camera on. No worries if not at all. No, I mean, no, I mean, that's a great answer. And in terms of the intellectual work and what we all do, that that makes complete sense. I suppose I, I want to know, you know, where are the where are the intelligent, thoughtful, left leading journalists who are actually going to coin the really catchy equivalent to 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 fight back? on our behalf you know that that's really what i'm getting at i guess sure well i think uh, i mean i've done a lot of uh, journalism in the past uh, two years and i think we all should be trying to do more uh I, I, yeah personally speaking i'm attempting to use my yeah my new hyperallergic um uh column uh which will be once a month to not just obviously you know <laughs> sort of the center my voice but also in different ways try to get some of the coverage of some of the things happening outside of the obvious sort of culture war work but i also think it's about making space it's about not taking up space commissioning and curating the work of the nigerian artist uh, victor eric amanor at st paul's cathedral which i did earlier this year where Victor could respond to the 125th anniversary of the Benin attack with a new artwork, which is uh, juxtaposed with the memorial to, to uh, Rawson, Admiral Rawson, who, who led that attack that's down in the Nelson Crypt. So underneath St. St. Paul's uh, Cathedral, there's this incredible space of, uh, of uh, monuments to all of these colonial military Sort of lead yeah, naval officers. Um, so that intervention, I think, incredibly important for just showing how it's a case by case basis. It's not about tearing down every statue, removing every memorial, but also it's not about uh, sim simply sort of uh, retain and explain either. Rewriting the label, you know, adding a caption, and there's a there's a link to Nathaniel uh, Coleman's work in the piece I just wrote for Hyper, you know, most recently for Hyperallergic. And I mean, Nat's work, you know, they are such an important voice in terms of um, thinking about the alternatives of uh, rewriting the plaque uh, and seeing change in different ways. It has to be case by case. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, we need, I mean, there, there are some wonderful uh, journalists out there who are, who are trying their best. I also think social media is really changing this as well. I think the freedom, you know, and the more, how to put it, more uh, devolved sort of nature of the public conversations we're having and the public uh, discourses are incredibly important, so. Thanks very much, Dan. Um, Kate, you have your hand up. Do you want to unmute? Yes. Yeah, go for um, it. Just unmuted myself. Um, yes. and. Apologies for this, because, uh, sorry, I have to say I'm feeling a bit more pessimistic. Um, and that's because in spite of everything um, that uh, you, you've talked about that's going on, that's that's positive, I, I worry that all these seeds are being thrown out, but there is not sort of the fertile ground for them to land in because, because of... Um, school education. Uh, I have two children who um, both have just been studying history in secondary school and when I was first told that their curriculum would be sort of the short 20th century 1918 to 1990 I thought I said to their teacher yay decolonization and she said oh sorry that's not in the curriculum. Um, that I find it incredibly frustrating, and I've spoken to my children. Actually, they're they're probably bored of hearing about it, but and they were really quite shocked because they think of the empire in Victorian terms. Oh, that was ages ago, and they were they were positively shocked when I said actually, the empire ended more recently than the Second World War, about which you have learned again and again and again at school. Um, so I'm just not sure that in the wider society there's the sort of foundational knowledge to take in um well or to, to make sense of um 
new information that might be provided by, you know, better curated museums, um, tackling issues around historical monuments and so forth. Uh, so that, on that side, I'm rather pessimistic. Sure. On one note of optimism, um, Victoria, I think it was, talked about journalism. I'm a huge fan of Gary Young, um, used to be of The Guardian, now at Manchester University, but I'm really glad to say is still very much on the um, public outreach side. I think he's fantastic. So that's my positive conclusion. <laughs> OK, thanks. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. I think, I mean, I think, I mean, the positive side for me in some ways is that our museums, and there were other examples of this in our universities, are the public spaces for some of our disciplines that we're talking about here. So there is a potential to think about the public realm and the public space in different ways and to sort of make these narratives. But no, I mean, I think on the pessimism, yeah. You know, we have to recognize that there is a kind of history writing that takes away history, that hides history. There's a kind of, there's a, there are some statues that are designed to stand in front of another thing we could be looking at mm -hmm. and to distract us. Um, think about, I mean, we have a prime minister that has written a, a, a biography of uh, Churchill and threatens to write, you know, you know, write one of Shakespeare. You know, I mean, that, that kind of, Again, I mean, back to Hugh Trevor Roper, that kind of history that you've got to love the history that, that, you know, that you're telling, that has to shift. Schools are central, but I am optimistic that in, in higher education, we continue to be the spaces that can start to set these agendas. There's such an appetite among the teachers I talk to and the schools groups that I, I speak to and so on, actually to engage with, with, you know, with these issues, you know, with these issues, but they need us to be writing books and writing uh, doctorates and researching the topics that open up a space that has been actively hid. These aren't histories in the same way that have been hidden in the direct way of the idea that the British famously you know, burnt all the documents, you know, after empire, but they did other things that hid or distracted or dressed up in different ways. And I think that that is, so the part of it, I also think, what is it we're opening up? I mean, we can talk about, I mean, we could go to Michelle Wolf, uh, Truelo's fantastic work on silencing, his notion that, that in his book, uh, Silencing the Past, where he talks about, about mentions and silences. So history writing is not just about what you mention, a silence is actively made in the same way as a mention, and an omission is, is we have to treat an omission as the same way as a statement. And he has this wonderful line that silencing the past is like uh, silencing a gun. Um, but equally, we can say that the removals, the making up, making up space on a uh, curriculum, on a reading list, or removing a statue or renaming a building, that can not only open up, I think, negative space, it can open up uh, what Ashil and Bembe has called a negative moment, in that uh, like a space of time, and I am really, I mean, we could, this, this could go, we could, this moment we're living in, absolutely, we could, we could miss all of the opportunities that are in front of us, like we did in 2007 for the 200 year anniversary of, of, of abolition, where, where, of course, under a Labour government, over, under uh, Gordon Brown, with his agenda of the British, actually, oh, come on, let's just be positive about the past, let's celebrate, you know, abolition in this way we missed that opportunity. 15 years later, we're at the beginning, I hope, of a decade where there is a new generation, both of sort of my age who are, who are teaching in sort of middle age in the universities that have lived a very different life in terms of our cultural refer reference points of the Berlin Wall falling, of our relationship to empire and so on, but also of a new generation who have just, yeah, time's up for so much of the stuff that's been you know, that's been part, part of how we how we frame things. Um, and so sorry, to answer the question there, it wasn't a Sheila Mbembe who wrote uh, Silencing the Past, it was uh, Truelo, Michelle Wolf uh, Truelo. But I also mentioned the Sheila Mbembe, who I very much uh, uh, encourage everyone to read as well. 
Great, thanks very much. Um, talking of times up, we are at the times up time, I'm afraid, in very awful, pragmatic ways. Um, but I just wanted to mention as well, because Ruth's really interesting comment in the chat there about their work um, on uh, games and white supremacy within it and thinking about canon as a concept as well um, and establishing space. I thought it was a really, really interesting intervention. To absolutely. If it, and so if I can say one final yeah, thing really quickly. If some of you have to go, that's absolutely fine. But Dan, if you're happy to respond, yeah. please, please so, do. And so really, really fast, simply to say that this has, this has to be about a moment about recognizing cultural whiteness. It has to be, I think, there is a really central role um, for the whole of the academy in these conversations to, to be looking at, as ourselves, at our disciplines, at the narratives that we tell in something very different to a 90s reflexive way, a self-awareness that was there 30 years ago. We need to be more than reflexive because being self-aware is not what this is about. If it's not hurting, then it's not working. We need to be undermining ourselves in very real ways in terms of, in terms of cultural whiteness. You know, we need to be really thinking about what space we open up so that other histories, other ways of seeing, other forms of knowledge are, are able, to, able to come in. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. And you're getting lots of extremely uh, appreciative comments in the chat. And I will directly address uh, Bomb Keys as well to say, I'm sorry about the shortness of the time, but we do have people who are going into summer school sessions at, at two o'clock. So, um, but hopefully people will be able to go back to the recording, reflect further on it. I'm sure we can take ideas that Dan's talked about today into future SAGS of programming. And anyone who wants to kind of talk to me about that, please, please do. That would be enormously um, great to, to do that. Just before I do a final thanks to Dan, just a bit of a heads up. Um, so as I mentioned, we do have um, two days of in-person summer school at the University of Strathclyde, and we still have bookings open for our keynotes there. So on Thursday afternoon at 4.30, if you're able to make it into Glasgow, um, three of our alumni are talking about their work in terms of knowledge exchange, um, public impact, et cetera. And I think in itself that will pick up on some of those, what do we do as academics when we're, we're trying to talk to the rest of the world? So Saxa Public's Platforms and Performances is happening at 4.30 on Thursday. Um, our keynote, who was going to be in person um, on Thursday, uh, Friday morning, Kat Young Nickel um, from Goldsmiths, unfortunately, is now going to be online um, because of the strikes and travel plans being thrown into disarray, unfortunately. The upside of that is that we think we're therefore going to be able to open it both for people who are in Strathclyde to watch online, but also for those of you who can't make it into Glasgow on Friday yourselves. Um, so we'll hopefully be able to set up a Zoom link. So watch out for communications around that. So that's my uh, closing up of what's happening next in terms of keynotes. But before I do that again, just thanks so much again Again, Dan, um, really great talk. Um, I, I really enjoyed hearing you being optimistic as well. It's fantastic with an early career researcher audience to think about, you know, that, that kind of generational moment that you talked about and what our researchers in arts and humanities can contribute to that. So thanks very much once again, Dan. Thanks very much, everybody. See hey, you thanks, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>